The Gospel lesson today comes to us from the Gospel according to Mark, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 11. Let us hear now the word of the Lord. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Let us pray. O oh God, we pray that you would come over us. O oh God, we pray that you would overcome us. Amen. Palm Sunday is one of the most notable, one of the most memorable Sundays, perhaps, in the Christian year. Maybe third only to Christmas Eve services and to Easter, which we anticipate next Sunday. Many of us, perhaps, who grew up in the church, we have memories of palm branches being waved, of being children who were ushered to the front as we marched around with our palm branches singing praise to God, Hosanna in the highest, some sort of Hosanna song. There's two or three that have kind of been used over the years. Um, and so this is, this is something that is outside of the norm of church uh, as we normally gather on Sunday. It's, it's memorable in that way. It's also memorable in the way in which we rehearse this every year over and over again is we remember the final, war, uh, the final week of the earthly life of Jesus before his arrest, his death, and his resurrection. And so it's something that for many of us perhaps has become routine. We think we know the story. We think we know what's going on. And so, so I believe that it's pretty easy for us to, to tune out to what's going on. It's the same pageantry year after year. And well, it's not major pageantry just to wave branches of palm trees, but it is perhaps for us in the church and in a way that we've talked about. But I want us to hear again and to see again what's going on. And I want us to trace this line. Sometimes we as preachers, we talk about this is one of the only times in which Jesus really allows this open praise of himself to happen, this this almost worship of Jesus, this celebration as the kingship of Jesus is revealed as we see a glimpse of that in his earthly life, something we don't really see as he comes humble as a servant most of the time. And even here he comes humble, riding not on a stallion, but riding on a colt, on a donkey that has never been ridden. Perhaps we can anticipate or see the clumsiness of, of this beast of burden that Jesus sits on that has never been ridden before. I don't know if you know much about donkeys. I know very little about donkeys. I've ridden a donkey once in high school to play a game of basketball. It's another story for another time, but even donkeys that have been ridden before are sometimes hard to ride, and this donkey has never been ridden. And Jesus comes. And when we trace what happens in the story, we know that, that Jesus, either by some uh, foresight or by planning, knows that there's a donkey that is tied there. We don't know how he knows, but he knows. And so he instructs his disciples to go. And if they're questioned about what they are doing, they're simply to say that they will bring it back. The Lord needs it and will bring it back. 
And the people there who questioned them indeed let them go for Jesus to use the donkey, and we presume that after he had used it, they returned it. But I want us to focus on, in this story, the crowd. The, the crowd praises Jesus as he rides in, and then there's not some climax that, that, that reaches some crescendo at the end of this story. By the time Jesus gets to Jerusalem, he looks around. He goes to the temple and he sees what's going on. It's late. And so he simply goes home. He goes back to Bethany with the 12. There's nothing, there's no action. There's no, there's no anything that's led to other than him coming in on a donkey and the response of the crowd. And what is the response of the crowd? The response of the crowd is to sing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is a quotation from, from Psalm 118. In fact, the latter portions of that. But I want us to read all of Psalm 118. We probably know more of it than we think we know. Psalm 118, starting in verse 1, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. There's a theme there in the first four verses, focusing on the enduring love of God, his goodness that goes on and on for eternity. Verse 5, in my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can humans do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humanity. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me. But in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side. But in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I, will, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely and he has given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. This psalm obviously is about Jesus. And the way in which he opens and provides salvation for us. And it gives us glimpses to what true salvation is. We continue verse 22 and 23. We see this echoed actually in 1 Peter chapter 2 as well. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this. And it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord save us. O oh Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. I will give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This psalm, then, is about the love of God that endures forever and that endures forever in Jesus. Not only that, it speaks of Jesus as our salvation and that our success comes from what God has done for us, that he is our salvation, that he is the one who has come to us. And so we join in with bows in hand in this festal procession, which leads up to the horns of of the altar. And we know that Jesus, as he goes into Jerusalem, he goes to the temple. But the temple that he goes to is not the heavenly temple. It is the Jerusalem temple. It is a copy of the true temple in heaven. And we know that the horns of the altar 
refer to that mercy seat of which we've spoken of, and Jesus is anticipating and looking forward to his blood being shed for us, that by his blood we may receive forgiveness of sins, and his blood is not laid on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem, but the heavenly temple. But I want us to look at this also. Because as I was preparing, I think so much that that I am like the crowd. Perhaps you are like someone in the crowd as well. We're all excited and anticipating and we want to praise Jesus. But we want to praise Jesus in terms of what we want Jesus to be and of who we want Jesus to be, what we want Jesus to do for us. In preparation for this sermon, one of one of the people I listen to on occasion is is a pastor, a preacher named Alistair Begg. He's a Scottish pastor. He, he pastors in Ohio, and he has for some time. But one of the references he makes, and he draws this parallel, he talks about the paralytic who was lowered through the roof for Jesus to heal. And and I think that's a good reference for us. I think it's a good reference for me. because Because in that story, if we remember it well, we remember that this man was paralytic and his friends brought him because he could not bring himself and and the crowds were so large that they could not get to Jesus and so they took off the tiles of the roof and they lowered Jesus or they lowered their friend to Jesus and it is in that moment it is in the midst of that uh, scene that Jesus says son your sins are forgiven and of course the religious leaders there get upset they say only God can forgive sins what is this man doing what is Jesus saying he can't do that we can anticipate that this man's life would not have changed. They would continue to have been a paralytic. If Jesus had merely said, your sins are forgiven, there would be nothing in the earthly realm. There would be nothing in the physical nature that would have changed. And so it would have been very easy for Jesus to say, and there would have been no demonstration of the power that Jesus really had, the authority to forgive sins. But Jesus says, I say this so that you know, he's saying this for the religious folk there, for the religious leaders, that I have power, that I have dominion even over sin, to forgive sin. But because I have power to say that, I also can say this, and he says to the paralytic, get up, take your mat, walk, and go home. And he does. And Jesus forgives the man's sins, but he also heals his paralysis. And if I am to think rightly of myself, and if my friends were to lower me to Jesus, and my question for me, my question for my heart, I hope you're, the question for your heart, for you to ask, is this. Would you rather Jesus say, your sins are forgiven, or would you rather say, take up your mat, walk, and be healed? Because I know what my heart wants. My heart desires my own success, my own achievement. I want God to help me. I want God to bless me. But I want him to make me whole for the sake of my purposes and my intentions. I would much rather Jesus say to me, you are healed, walk, take up your mat and go, than I would for Jesus to say your sins are forgiven. When we look at, at the, the tapestry of Scripture, we see this at work. We see this tension between what we want in our own fleshly desire and our sinful desire, what God desires for us. It's true from the very beginning. It's true from Adam and Eve and their desire to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that which God commanded them not to eat. But, the Satan, but Satan said, the serpent said, you will be like God and God knows this. And so so you should take it and you should eat it because in it you will find freedom to do what you want to do, that you may live untethered from God. They take and they eat. They desire the desires of their own heart to be free rather than to find freedom in their relationship with God. We see this as a theme in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, we read these words. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. 
So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen, do all the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know that what the king who will reign over them will do. It is not you they rejected, Samuel. It is me. And they have rejected me continually, constantly, consistently, over and over again since the day I brought them up out of Egypt. It's not you they rejected. It's me they rejected. They want a king fashioned in their own eyes. They want a king who will come and who will serve them. They don't want a king who is truly authoritative over them. They don't want a relationship with me. They don't want, and we see this in John, right? John 6, they don't want me. Jesus says, you aren't looking for me. You're looking for what I can do for you. You're looking for your own success. You're looking for a free lunch. You want me to provide food for you in perpetuity, but you don't really want me. I can't help but think that the crowd is like this. I can't help but think that I am like this. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Jesus, won't you be like David? Won't you restore Israel to her former glory that she will be a marvel among the nations? That the people will come from all over the world to marvel at who Israel is? God, that we would have success for ourselves. How often do we want Jesus on our own terms? Do we want Jesus for who Jesus can be for us rather than Jesus who is the Jesus of scriptures, the true Jesus? Jesus enters Jerusalem and surely there's an anticipation that this is the moment in which Jesus is going to let all, all heaven burst loose. That Jesus will come and he will conquer. He will conquer the Roman Empire. He will set Israel free. He will reestablish a palace in Jerusalem and he will reign. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that so much of our heart's desire? But it's not God's desire. God's desire is not for him to work in such a way that we have such earthly success that praise is brought to us. That's not God's desire. God's desire is for us to be reconciled to him in such a way that we would know him, that we would walk humbly with him, that we would seek mercy and justice, and that we would love the Lord with all of who we are. Do we do that? Do I do that? Do you do that? It's hard for me to say. It's hard for me to say yes anyway to that. When Psalm 118 says that Jesus becomes the capstone, the stone that the builders have rejected, Peter picks up on that theme. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 4, says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by people, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. You are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Your purpose, my purpose, is to reflect the glory of God, to give him praises in the world, to praise him. In fact, as Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he talks about where are those who are wise in the world, 
And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 22, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. We come to Christ, we come to praise him because he is the king. He is not a king in the way in which our world would like a king. He is not a warring king. He is not a conquering king. He is a humble king. He's not a king often in the ways in which we would want a king. But he's the king. May we bow down and may we worship. Amen.